Our text today is read from the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, beginning with verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are made manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. The drunkenness is the work of the flesh that we wish to comment on today. And this vice has a wider application than we have wanted to give it in the past. It's a term that is not only applied by the Bible to drinking alone, in 1 Corinthians 11.21, as we noted last week, it is also applied by the Apostle to an excess of food and in a particular context. For in eating, everyone taketh his own supper, taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. The guilty people involved are interested only in their fulfillment their pleasure, no one else's. They let this take precedence over the needs, the courtesy, the charity, the demands of Christian discipleship where others are concerned. Activities that fall into that category of wantonness and excess are drunkenness, according to this passage, drunkenness. And this means, I guess, that there are many, many people in the Christian church today, fundamental evangelical church, never taken a drink of anything alcoholic, who are drunks. In our capitalistic society, we have come to the conclusion that it's all right for one Christian to have more than he needs while his brethren around him go without. Well, this we justify on the grounds that this is a capitalistic nation. We know that this is a godly form of politics and economy. Well, but this is another of the lies of the Western world that put the big lie to the idea that this is a Christian country or that it ever was. Listen to a few verses from the Bible on the subject. Now remember, this is the Bible. It's 2,000 years old. The church started at Pentecost. didn't start at 1776. Now keep that in mind. And all that believed were together and had all things common. This is the Bible now. This is Acts 2, verses 44 through 47. So get that scrunch off your face and listen. All that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. In Acts 4.32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction 
The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying with us which much, praying us which with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye, through his poverty, might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to the man hath, and not according to the he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye be burdened, but by any quality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there be an equality, as it is written, He that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered, gathered little had no lack. And that's, of course, reference to the rules for the man in the wilderness, the bread from heaven. In First John, the third chapter, in verse 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? In First Timothy 6, in verses 17 through 20, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. In 1 Timothy 6, and verses 3 to, through 10, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, wherein come envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Revelation 2, verses 8 and 9, And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive, I know thy poverty, I know thy works, 
and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Revelation 3 and verses 14 through 21, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel of thee, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. James 2, verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him, but ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? Drunkenness in the sin of excess, a work of the flesh. Now, reveling is also a sin which is much in evidence in the church today. People go to church not to worship, but to be entertained. They're not interested in Wednesday night prayer meetings, but they will be there if there's a church party. They'll stay home from church on Sunday night if there's a good program on TV and on Sunday morning if a good football game is being shown. They live for vacations, and while they think nothing of spending a few thousand dollars gadding around the country, they simply do not have enough money to support the Lord's work, let alone to help out the needy. The modern church is not characterized for its piety and reverence. It's known for its reveling, socializing, and cashing in on religion. Now, these are common things in the religious world. Does the fact that everyone is doing them in any way lessen the seriousness of it? No, not at all. St. Paul is very clear on the subject. Listen to it. Listen. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, they which do such things shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Does this mean that people who do these things are not going to heaven when they die? Well, they may not, of course, but not necessarily. And it's not what St. Paul means when he says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is a subject that is completely lost on the premillennialist who is totally misled and misleading others on the subject of the kingdom of God. But in the true doctrine of the true church and to the honest seeker, there is a message here that is meaningful and powerful and a bit frightening. This is also one of the most confusing subjects, issues in Christianity today, and it's necessary to get a correct understanding of what the Apostle means before being able to understand and benefit from this warning. In order to give the meaning of this passage proper foundation, it's necessary to rehearse something that we've talked about quite a bit when we studied Hebrews, but 
haven't gone into in depth for a while in any case. I'm not going to be able to finish this particular subject today because of the time, but we'll start it and go as far as we can. Man is a tripartite being according to historic Orthodox Christianity. There are those in the Christian world who are dichotomous and believe that there are only two parts to man. They claim to be orthodox in their theology on this point, but they are not. Orthodoxy from St. Paul to St. Augustine to the present time is unanimous in its voice. Man is body, soul, and spirit. Each of these three aspects of man fell into condemnation when Adam sinned. The great salvation accomplished by Christ provides for the salvation of each of these three areas of man. Thus, salvation exists in three parts, which are justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification answers to the Spirit. When man comes to Christ in repentance and is converted, his spirit is quickened and made alive. Man, through identification with Christ in the cross, dies with Christ, is buried with Christ, is resurrected with Christ, and is born spiritually into the family of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3 and verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In John 1, beginning with verse 11, we are told, He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. In the first chapter of St. Peter's first letter to the church, beginning with verse 18, it is written, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that you love one another pure, with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. We get into the family of God by birth. This birth takes place at repentance and conversion. In the first Peter passage, we are told that the seed or the sperm of God who fathered us, unlike the life that we receive from Adam, is incorruptible and abides forever. We will be alive as long as God is alive, because he has fathered us by the gospel, and it is his life and nature that we have. This birth and new life process 
takes place by the New Testament principle of baptism into death and resurrection with Christ as the Holy Ghost baptizes us into Christ. If we have been baptized into his death, we are told in the sixth chapter of Romans, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. This is an unseen and an unfelt baptism. It's in the spirit realm. It's what Orthodox Christianity calls the mystical baptism of the Holy Ghost, not to be confused with the so-called Holy Ghost baptism of charismatic humanism. This, then, is the salvation of the Spirit in justification. It is salvation from the penalty of sin, and it is a past salvation. We have been saved. Another aspect of salvation is the salvation of the body. This is a future salvation, and it's a salvation from the presence of sin. It, too, is accomplished by baptism into death and resurrection with Christ. This mortal must put on immortality, and this corruptible must put on incorruption, said St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that, how that which was first is not spiritual, but that which was natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, and as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such also are they, this, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And it would be good if we had time to go through this passage verse by verse, but we do not. In fact, we don't have any more time at all, and we'll have to take this up next time when I will give you the main features of what it is saying. It's saying that there's a spiritual body, and we shall have it in the resurrection. It is the physical image of Christ, the second Adam, or the father of the new race. It's an incorruptible and glorious body, and no one can go physically into the kingdom of God. No one can go physically into the kingdom of God without this new body, and that's what we'll go over in a little more detail next time, if the Lord is...